let me just start by for your the disruption of your schedule because I was supposed to speak last week and something came up and it was rather short notice. So I'm very grateful to you for uh, accommodating me. Um, I, I, I'm guessing that this might be a bit of a departure from the kind of stuff you've been hearing. Um, uh, for uh, full dis disclosure, I must um, tell you that I'm a physics dropout and uh, I'm still learning biology. So I do feel intimidated by such an audience, uh, but hopefully we'll find some middle ground where I can communicate some of our more recent findings uh, from the lab. I'll, I'll start off by setting up the stage for the basic premise of the kind of work I do. Uh, there's a gentleman called Joseph Ledoux in NYU um, who has pioneered this field of studying how fear memories are encoded in the brain. And uh, many years ago, he, he wrote this Scientific American article, which we still use, which basically explains the framework for understanding how uh, fear responses are uh, processed in, in brains across species from, in, in mammalian brains in, in particular. So he describes these as uh, the low and high roads to fear. So if you now see a snake in a forest happens, you don't have to go to a forest, you can go to NCBS campus. And this happened to me six times this month, actually. So, um, and if you see something that looks like a snake, your brain is programmed to assume it's a snake and respond very, very quickly. Okay, so when this happens, you get a visual input through your retina to your visual thalamus, and then it has two roads. It, it, it can quickly go to the amygdala, which is the fear center of the brain, where this information will be processed very quickly, and it will then send out responses that will get you ready for a fight or flight response. Uh, hopefully, mostly flight response. And, and your blood pressure goes up, everything goes up, and you run away. And while this happens, the same information can also go to the higher cortical areas, such as the visual cortex, which is much better equipped to understand and analyze that information and process it. It takes a little longer. And then it may figure out it was indeed a snake, or it might figure out it was a rope. In which case, then it sends an input back to the amygdala, asking it to calm down, and then silencing, suppressing that fear response. That's how most things happen. That's how evolutionary, that's the value we have of having a structure like the amygdala under the control of higher cortical areas. So he calls this quick road, the low road, um, is one that is uh, fast and less refined. It's a quick and dirty solution geared towards survival and erring on the side of caution. And there's the high road, which is slower but more precise, uh, and gives you a better situation dangerous or not. All right, so here's the human amygdala. It's a coronal section of the brain, meaning at this plane. And here's where the amygdala is, very nondescript. Here are the cortical folds. Here's the midline of the brain. Now, here's a, a, a structural MRI scan of a patient who now lives in New York. Her initials are SM, because you have to uh, uh, keep her uh, privacy intact. And she's one of those rare cases of what is called a congenital amygdala degeneration. For some reason, she's just missing the amygdala and nothing else. It's a remarkably rare case, but very, very useful, because you can now do some very interesting experiments with such a patient. What kind of experiments? Something like, uh, akin to Pavlovian conditioning. You all remember Pavlov's dogs ringing the bell, um, that is innocuous, meaningless, but you pair that with food reward, and then later on when you ring the bell, the animal remembers, associates that bell with a reward and salivates. So this is an aversive version of the same task. Every time there's a blue screen, blue box flashed on the screen, SM receives a skin to the sh uh, shock to the skin. Okay? And every time she sees a yellow square on the screen, there's no shock. So very soon, normal individuals will learn that blue means shock, yellow means no shock, this is dangerous, this is safe. You become afraid of the dangerous shock, and you can show that by simply measuring the skin conductance uh, of the individual. The more you sweat because of your fear, skin conductance goes up, so you can get a very quick readout of the fear response of the individual. So in a normal human being, you can see that when you give the shock alone, 
they're of course afraid, conductance goes up, you give the yellow, nothing happens, you give the blue, it evokes a fear response. Remember, this is not blue alone without a shock. So the person remembers that when I saw the blue yesterday, I got a shock, so this is dangerous. You do the same experiment with SM now, something remarkable happens. She gives a shock, fear response to the shock, nothing to the yellow, but nothing to the blue either. Okay? So this means somehow that she is not showing a fear response to the blue. Now remember, a fear response is actually a spontaneous autonomic response. You cannot control it. If you're afraid, you're afraid. Right? So there's no conscious recall or anything. It happens automatically, and she doesn't have that response. So patient SM then fails to learn the color shock association, and she has no subconscious fear response that tells her that blue means dangerous. Okay? But you could still ask, does the patient have conscious knowledge of the color shock association? Maybe she just doesn't understand the factual association between blue and shock. So does she know that the color means shock? Now, fortunately, in this case, because it's a human being, you can ask her that question, and here's her answer. Notice that there's anything odd about my reactions to normal lifestyle, life threats. My fear element seems to be, to me, in my head, normal. I've never noticed anything odd. And, um... How do you feel seeing these results? I'm dead. I think that it's probably absolutely correct. I know I don't sweat. Um, I knew that there was an anticipation that the blue square was going to, at some particular point in time, bring on one of the volt shocks. But even though I knew that, and I knew that from the very beginning, Except for the very first one where I was surprised. I really don't think that um, it, it, I mean, I knew it was going to happen, but that was my response. I knew it was going to happen. I accepted that it was going to happen. So I learned from the very beginning, it's going to happen. Blue shock happened. I turned out to be right. It happened. So it's very clear that uh, she's trying to make a, you know, sense of all of this. She knows she's not afraid. She knows that blue is shock. So she's made that association, yet she has no subconscious fear response. Yes? Is she afraid of anything? Yeah, so the, this is a learned fear, right? Blue in itself is not fear. So it's a learned fear. She does know that you, know, you cannot just walk into New York City traffic and it will get knocked out. Right? So how much of that is learned fear and how much is innate fear is debatable. But she does have innate fears, some innate fears that she's, I think, probably by association learned through other mechanisms that does not require direct factual associations. So, yeah. Yes, uh, that's another way of looking at the question. Is there a chance that the switch which she has to press to get the shock, that two switches, one, you know it's going to shock, you and that don't shock. Well, that's a very different question, right? That's about an operant conditioning, whether you learn something and you choose to make a decision in favor of that. I mean, I don't think she'll have any difficulty learning the task and understanding that this will happen. The, it's a very, this is the simplest form of the task you can do, because essentially, because the amygdala is not there, Although the factual association is made, being made, the fear memory actually formed as a result of that association in the amygdala is not happening, right? So the blue is coming in and everything has happened, but the fear response is not coming out of the amygdala, right? Because the amygdala is missing. That's, I think, the simplest association, uh, it's the simplest uh, conclusion one can draw from. Huh? Because it's mi missing the amygdala. No, similar experiments have been done with monkeys, then with humans, uh, other humans, and lots of rats, and all that. But this is a sort of a graphic demonstration of the fact that when you just are lacking the amygdala, you can, this can happen, right? And of course, it's really backed up by the beauty of this thing is you can do the same experiment in a rat, right? And then remove the amygdala in the rat and show the same thing, and, and on and on and on. And I'll show you more ways of doing that. So here's the. Rat equivalent, where 99% of the experiments have been done, 
So you now play a sound instead of a blue, blue color. You play a sound which is innocuous. This is Pavlov's experiment, essentially. Ring a bell. Doesn't mean anything. You ring a bell and give a shock, and soon the animal learns that this, this uh, pro, you know, uh, is going to be dangerous. The bell used to be innocuous, but now it's dangerous. And the next day you bring it in and just play the bell. It remembers, and it freezes. Now it's the freezing is the behavioral response in terms of fear, okay? not the sweating. So this is what it looks like in real life. Uh, here are two rats. Uh, when the tone comes on, the light come on here. So these are, uh, yeah, the animals are moving around in their home cage. Now the tone comes on. This guy doesn't make much of it, this guy does. Both have undergone the same tone shock association learning the previous day, okay? Just one is more afraid than the other. So this is how we quantify it. We videotape it and we quantify it. More freezing, more the f stronger the fear memory. Now, over the last 20 years or so, uh, extensive analysis has essentially established what happens in the amygdala when these fear memories are formed, starting with the behavior, circuit analysis, single neuron, synapses, molecules, and genes. So we know this, that the amygdala, these neurons in the amygdala are forming these memories, and we know how to track them. Okay, This is a very quick summary of a large body of work. So. The question then is, the question that I'm interested in, is the fear, now you understand fear. Fear is a response to a specific and imminent threat that you have to respond to, to survive. Um, yes? Well, this kind of thing can last for months, actually. Even three or four pairings of this, the animal will show a fear response a month later or two months later. It's very strong and persistent. Yeah. Yeah, it will then show a, a appetitive condition. You can do that as well. And the amygdala, a different part of the amygdala is involved in that. Yeah, that that can be done as well. But the fear learning is far more powerful because it's very hard, easy to tell when an animal is afraid. It's much harder to tell when an animal is happy, especially a rat, right? Because you have no way of knowing. Yeah, that's the simple reason why most of these studies have been done with fear conditioning rather than positive appetitive conditioning. Yeah, you can switch. You can switch valence anytime. Yes. Yeah, you can do back and forth. You can do multiple conditionings. All of that's possible. Yeah. So fear you understand now, but what's anxiety? Anxiety is when you're afraid of something that's not even happening. You're worried that something will happen. There's no clear and present danger, yet you're afraid. So fear you re realize you need it for survival, right? Anxiety is too much of a good thing. You're afraid when you shouldn't be, right? Both of them depend on the amygdala, okay? Both, one is health, one is disease, okay? Strong and healthy fear is necessary. Anxiety is not, that's the disorder. Both of them involve the same set of neurons in the amygdala. How is that possible? Because these are very different things, if you think about it, okay? One is pathology, one is health, a healthy response. So this anxiety, very simply put, is being afraid one when one shouldn't be. Another way of thinking of it is that fear is a fear memory is formed in response to a specific cue, the blue box, not the yellow box. And generalized or non-specific fear is anxiety. You're afraid of everything, right? So in the context of SM, you can imagine then if SM was if an individual was being afraid of both yellow and blue, that's anxiety or any color, or any sound, that's anxiety. Fear of blue alone is Q-specific fear. So fear memories, of course, are crucial for survival, yet excessive generalization of such memories, characterized specifically by failure to discriminate safe and dangerous, is the hallmark of uh, anxiety disorders, right? That's when trouble starts. And specifically, this is seen in, in an excessive dose in post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, where not only PTSD patients show a high-risk fear response to a threatful situation, but they often show a failure to discriminate between safe and dangerous, and they start being afraid of everything, right? So the classic example is Vietnam War veterans who are in back home in America 20, 30 years later, and for a completely innocuous stimulus, they show the full-blown response 
fear response that they had shown in the battlefield 30 years ago, right? And they cannot get over it. Okay, so that's PTSD, and that's the problem. You cannot discriminate safe and dangerous. So if you now look image to functional MRI of such patients, there are many studies showing that the amygdala is hyperactive in these patients, of PTSD patients. There are several examples of showing that the increased activation of the amygdala is positively correlated with an anxiety score in PTSD. And there are several examples of that. So you can, what you glean from this is two things. That there's impaired safety signal learning. They cannot discriminate between safe and dangerous. And there's hyperactivity in the amygdala. And this amygdala is the same structure that's encoding specific fear memories, but also are giving rise to anxieties. So how is that possible? So the first question that we want to address is, what is the exact nature of this hyperactivity in the amygdala? Computationally, this is a challenging problem because you do want to learn what is dangerous. And you do want to generalize. We always generalize. You get mugged in the inner city of Baltimore, you will be afraid of a certain race for some time, right? But you're not going to be afraid for a lifetime, right? So how do you make that distinction between safe and dangerous? And if is this hyperactivity, how does the amygdala discriminate? And then how do you make a transition from specific fear to generalized fear? Because that's the crux of the problem, that the same neurons in the amygdala are doing both, so there must be switching between states. And how does that happen? What's the dynamics there? So those are the two questions. Now, traditionally, when I started looking at this problem, what I found that was a big problem in neuroscience was when you look at fear memories, you use fear conditioning the way I showed you, right? A very specific behavioral paradigm. When you look at anxiety in rats, they're normally put into a box which has either a dark side or a well-lit side, and there's a conflict situation, and you let see how long they've spent in each side. The more anxious the animal is, more it hides in the dark side, and it doesn't go out on the light side. So you just quantify that. Now these are very, these are not even apples and oranges. They're very different tasks. So it's impossible to, you know, really understand this transition by using such different behavioral tasks. So one way to get around this is to actually go back to the SM kind of experiment, where you have these two stimuli, one, sa one dangerous, one safe. Now we can imagine that if you now had a fear response to the yellow, abnormally high response to the yellow, that's generalization of fear, right? That's anxiety, right? So you can adapt this to rats by doing the following thing. You now give two tones for the two colors, blue and yellow, and only one of the tones, the blue tone, is paired with the shock. The shock in this lingo is called unconditioned stimulus, and the innocuous stimulus is called the conditioned stimulus, which has been conditioned with the shock. So the condition stimulus, which is the to in this case the tone or the color, is being paired with the shock, and then there's a sec second distinct color or tone that is never paired with the shock. And if you do this a few times, the animal quickly learns, and it will show a very high fear response to the condition stimulus, the CS plus, but never a lot less to the CS minus, which was never paired with the shock. So is this clear, right? And so you'll see a very distinct freezing response more to the CS plus, a lot less to the CS minus. If you now have this animal generalized, you can imagine that it will now start freezing even more, also more to the CS minus, the yellow. If it starts becoming afraid to the yellow, then it's generalizing that fear. So that's the basic paradigm. And that's, so then we wanted to know if we can look at this, if you now increase the shock intensity, meaning that suppose you double the shock, the cost of getting it wrong is much higher, right? So the animal is going to err on the side of caution and will start freezing more to the CS minus as well, just to be safe, just in case it's become dangerous. So that's the psychology behind this. So what we did is essentially train rats to have one tone paired with the shock, another tone not paired with the shock, and then double the shock intensity and then see what happens to the animal. Does the animal generalize? And that's essentially what Shupriya Ghosh did in my lab, another physics dropout, who actually I stole from TIFR physics and, 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 and brought to Bangalore. And he basically compared two groups of rats, both of which were shocked, one with a weak shock and one with a strong shock, okay? And the strong shock, one, the weak shock was half a milliampere, the strong shock was one milliampere. Everything else was the same, okay? So the paradigm is as follows. You take a rat and you get them habituated to five of the safe tones, 
five of the dangerous stones. These are now innocuous, right? They've not been shocked with anything, paired with anything. So the animal doesn't care. And then next day, you now condition them so the, the CS plus, the, what is going to become the dangerous stone, is paired with the shock 10 times, and the CS minus is never paired. You give 10 of this, 10 of that. Next day, you come back, and you now play these back, five of the safe, five of the dangerous intermixed. And you see how the animal responds. If it remembers that the CS plus is dangerous, it will freeze more. If it thinks the CS minus is safe, it will freeze less. Simple behavior experiment. Okay? And the tones are very, very distinct. One is a 15 kilohertz click at 5 hertz. The other one is a 15, 5 kilohertz pure tone. So there are many features there that the animal should be able to distinguish. Okay? So the behavior works. First, you play the two tones before conditioning. It does, it's not afraid of them. It's low freezing. Next day after the learning, it only selectively increases its freezing to the CS+, plus, the dangerous tone, the blue, and not the yellow. Okay, so the animal understands and is able to discriminate between safe and dangerous. You can replot these in this kind of a plot that I'll use a lot. You now have freezing to CS+, plus, the dangerous tone here, and freezing to the safe tone here, the CS-, minus, both on the same plot. The diagonal is the line of no discrimination. It will freeze equally to both. If it's in this quadrant, it's more afraid of the CS+, plus. if it's here, it's more afraid of the safe tone, okay? So in this case, the animals are all moving towards the CS+, plus, higher freezing to CS+, plus, and no increase in freezing to the CS-. minus. So these animals are discriminating very well. In the same animals, Shupriyo had implanted multi-electrode arrays. Basically, each of these have eight wires in them, and each of these drives are independently movable, so that you now have 32 electrodes targeting directly into the amygdala and recording individual neuronal firing from the amygdala in the awake behaving animal. So this is surgically implanted first, then they recover, and then they learn, and then they remember, and all along we can record individual cell firing while this happens. Okay, so that's the experiment. Easier said than done. Um, so that's what Shupriyo did. And here are some responses now. So these are the raster plots. So these individual spikes here, ticks, are the firing of one action potential, one response of one neuron one at one time. And these are the responses to the safe tone. These are the responses to the dangerous tone. And this is over time. And this is when the tone comes on. This is when the tone comes off. Okay, so you read them like this. And you can now do multiple trials, accumulate all the firings, and you do a, a spike count plot where on this axis is the number of spikes fired, on this axis is time again, and you have tone on and tone on here, okay? So when you first play during the tone during habituation, before conditioning, the cells don't seem to fire very much, and they fire equally to the safe and dangerous tone. After conditioning, when the animal has learned that the CS plus is dangerous, and now you look at the firing, you see that the cells are specifically firing more to the dangerous tone over the safe tone. So just like the animal, these neurons in the lateral nucleus of the amygdala can discriminate between what is safe and what is dangerous because they're preferentially firing more to the dangerous tone. Okay? Is this plot clear? So this I would call a neuron that is Q-specific. It reflects the animal's behavior because it fires selectively more to the dangerous tone. So it's a Q-specific neuron. Yes? Do you have any uh, probes of uh, other regions just to show that they are absolutely not being affected by this? Yeah, so that's been done before, right? So if you look at, so you go to the hippocampus, enabling learning and memory structure. And if you do this particular task, you will not... Yeah. You can use the hippocampus to do the same task if you're now being learning to be afraid of a context, like the room. In that case, the hippocampus will also fire, right? But this is just the tone, and the hippocampus is not involved. So there are ways of controlling for it. In fact, not all the cells are firing either. As I'll show you, even within the amygdala, there's sparse coding. So half the cells actually do not participate in this memory at all. Because you don't really expect all neurons in the amygdala devote themselves to one memory that will be a very inefficient system, right? So you'll actually see that. I'll show you that, that not all cells are responding. Yes? So is this one kind of pattern, that input pattern is kind of only this time lock just given there, or you have 
There are other ones which are physically active as well, tonically active as well. They'll be fired at the peak, they'll show a high firing at the beginning of the tone onset, and they'll keep firing at a lower rate, but at a higher rate afterwards as well. And those behavior are similar for CS minus and CS plus? Yes, we've seen it both. Nobody really knows what that means. So that's one of the problems is in that the focus has been on the first 200 milliseconds after the tone onset. And I was actually a, a person who's at one point considered coming here, Arvind Kumar, uh, has actually taken my data, it's trying to analyze it now to understand is there any information buried in the phasic responses later on. But the field generally has not focused on it yet. Yeah, LFPs we are also doing, but in LFPs what we get is more of the, you know, the different frequency bands, and theta firing, gamma firing, and so on, yeah. Yeah, there's the question, yeah. Do you also see used firing? Meaning? Uh, the sensor targeted for future firing, does it also use firing in the nearby Oh, I see. Yeah, you can record in multiple areas simultaneously and see increased correlation of firing under different behavioral conditions that can be done, yes. So, for example, the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala will fire in synchrony in certain phases of this learning, uh, but not in the same task, but variations of it. Yes, it can be done. So they're actually talking to other areas as well. Oh, these are long range connections. So amygdala is buried deep inside the temporal lobe, prefrontal cortex is here, that far, yes, that far. Especially with LFPs, local field potentials. Yeah, they're directly connected, yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, uh, no, no, but there are latency differences before and after conditioning, right? The latency becomes a lot shorter after conditioning, so for the, CS plus. for the CS plus, and latency in the order of 20 milliseconds or so, right? So these are the fast cortic thal thalamic inputs coming to the lateral nucleus. If you look at the cortical inputs, those will be 40 milliseconds or more, right? So that's one way of distinguishing where they're coming from. Right, right. No, we haven't. We haven't. No, we haven't looked at those. Yeah, but those are very likely to be inhibitory interneurons. Right. right. They'll be fast spiking. Uh, very different characteristics. So we have left those out. These are all what looks like excitatory pyramidal cells. Yeah. Very likely. Yeah. So here's another cell which is misbehaving. So you have before conditioning the same response, after conditioning this neuron is firing equally strongly to both the safe and dangerous tone. It does not make a distinction, right? So this is a generalized neuron. It is, although the animal knows what is dangerous, the neuron doesn't, right? So this is already a hint that not everybody is towing the line, there's sparse coding. So if you now look at all the cells we recorded from, about half of these cells shown in gray here just did not participate in this memory period. They did not respond at all during memory recall. In the other half, a vast majority, 42%, were Q-specific. They only fired more to the dangerous tone. And very few, 6%, were generalized neurons, which were unable to discriminate between safe and dangerous, okay? And this is by doing the Z-score calculations, as shown here. And so they're mostly falling on the upper quadrant, right, on this quadrant, where they're more firing more to the CS+. Plus. So you now this is all done with a weak shock, half a milliampere. You repeat the same experiment now with double the shock intensity, and you immediately see what's happening. The animals are also showing more freezing to the safe tone. They're now more afraid of what is the safe tone, the CS minus. So now you're moving more closer to the diagonal. So there's an increase in freezing this way, but there's also an increase in freezing to the safe tone. And you can now calculate an index of behavioral generalization where you look at the freezing percentage to the CS minus over CS plus, the higher this freezing to the safe tone is, the higher the index of behavioral generalization, simple calculation. And you see that with the weak shock, it's around here. With the strong shock, the generalization is more than doubled. The animals are really more afraid of the safe tone, right? So they're kind of losing it now. They're becoming afraid of the safe tone. And in these animals, a separate group of animals, if you now do the same recordings, the demographics is far different. You now see that 
a much larger portion of the neurons, 30% as opposed to 6%, are actually generalizing. They're unable to discriminate between safe and dangerous, and they're firing indiscriminately to both. Right? So the, the split has completely shifted now. There are many more of these cells in this quadrant now. Now, if you now look at this, you know, you, if you average across all of these neurons, this is what you see. Now, this average response of firing of all the neurons with the weak shock conditioning, they fire more to the CS plus as dangerous over the safe. But with the strong shock, there's hardly any difference. They're very close to each other. They are firing indiscriminately both safe and dangerous, okay? And if you now look at the index of behavioral generalization with the index of neuronal generalization, meaning how, dis how selective are they, you see that they are, there's a strong correlation between the behavioral generalization and the neuronal generalization in the two groups together. But the problem here is this shift, how is this shift happening? Why are there more cells that are generalizing now? Where do they come from? Where do they come from? We have no idea. Because it's the same, you know, the same protocol, only the shock intensity is higher. So to understand this shift in demographics, you cannot do comparison between two groups. You have to look at the same set of animals, right? And see the transition from Q-specific to generalized fear. So now the same experiments have to be repeated in the same animal over time. And that's what Shupri did next. So now you do the same protocol again, CS plus, CS minus. And then you test them with low shock. They're all afraid of the dangerous, not the safe. All is fine. Then in the same animals, after testing them, you double the shock intensity and recondition them again, but with double the shock. And now they test them on a third day and see what happens. And you see again the same shift. They're now becoming more afraid of the safe tone. They're showing behavioral generalization. So that same paradigm now holds in the same animal. Now the good news is, because you're capturing the transition from the specific to the generalized fear in the same animal, you can see what happens to individual neurons over time. How do they change their states? So you see the same behavioral shift. And now you start looking at the neurons. So here's now the z-score plot with weak shock and then after strong shock in the same animals. And you can see that you still have the same clustering of majority of neurons being Q-specific, only minority being non-specific. But after the shift to generalized fear, you have many more neurons that are generalizing. They don't discriminate between CS plus and CS minus. So you can capture this transition in the same animal, neuron by neuron. You can now chase them to find out where are these neurons coming from that are, are they coming fresh or are they arising from these populations? So let's give some examples. Here's a neuron that is Q-specific because it's firing more to the CS plus over CS minus after weak shock conditioning. And after strong shock conditioning, it remains specific. It still fires more to the dangerous over the same, uh, over the safe. So although the animal generalized, this neuron bucked the trend. It's still Q-specific, it's not generalizing. Okay, it's going against the behavioral trend. Here's another neuron that was Q-specific after weak shock conditioning, but starts generalizing after strong shock conditioning. So this is a striking example of a neuron that was specific and then changes color and becomes generalized and loses its ability to discriminate after strong shock conditioning, although it was doing just fine after the weak shock conditioning. This is the equivalent of our politicians changing parties. It was specific and generalized in the same go, the same neuron, and the same animal. Yes? So, uh, the yeah, we can hold that neuron, and we do you know, continuous cluster analysis and waveform separation. So we lose a lot of neurons, of course. Yeah. But so we... No, this is single unit, yeah. This is with, you know, doing the PCA and everything else, yeah. So now you see the same thing again. The population response is separating CS plus and CS minus um, after weak shock conditioning, but not so after strong shock conditioning. So now we can do the same plot again. The behavioral generalization and the neuronal generalization are correlated. But now because we did it in the same animal, we can see the transition. And you can see that in each case, the movement is along the diagonal. If neuronal generalization increases, so does behavioral generalization. So they're all moving along the diagonal, right? 
But the valuable information buried in here is that we can look at transitions now. What are the exact transitions at single neuron level that gives rise to this demographic shift? So here are um, the three transitions that we discovered. So first of all, to start with, we find cells that are not affected by fear conditioning. They don't change at all. They're the gray cells. Q-specific cells, which are firing more to the dangers versus safe, and non-specific cells that do not discriminate between the two. And a majority of these cells are specific, and a minority are not. And the transitions we see after strong shock conditioning are the following. Cells that used to be specific now become generalized. We saw that example of that. Cells that never change during weak shock conditioning do a double jump and become nonspecific. And cells that never changed after conditioning during the weak shock now become specific. And they make up for some of the losses that are happening from these two transitions. Right? That's how this population shift takes, takes place. So we can track it by neuron by neuron to tell you how the population shift happens. And these are the three transitions we see. So now the question is, now that we understand this at the single neuron level, what are the mechanisms that can mediate this transition? So we have looked at two things. We basically took the attitude that let's do weak shock conditioning and add some X factor to it to make it look like strong shock conditioning without actually doing strong shock conditioning. So you're still using weak shock, but you add something to the amygdala such that you fool the animal to believing that it became conditioned with a strong shock and then understand what that X factor does. Okay? So you're causally adding something to make it happen without actually using strong shock. And we do that in two ways. We do pharmacological manipulations inside the amygdala to add something to make it switch and also do optogenetic manipulations across a wider network. This comes back to the questions that's coming up in terms of network interactions. I'm going to, in the interest of time, skip this example and go straight to the unpublished work on the, on the optogenetic manipulations. Just to tell you that this part was done by targeting a specific signaling cascade molecule called PKA cyclic AMP. Upi may touch upon this later on in his talk. Uh, and this is a biochemical signaling molecule that is crucial for plasticity in the amygdala. And we artificially went and activated this pathway in the amygdala. And just giving that activation with weak shock made the animal act like strong shock. Okay? So that's one very cool finding. So that's what happens. You give weak shock plus cyclic AMP PK, it becomes as if it got strong shock, and we understand exactly what happens at the single neuron level to make that happen. But I'll skip that part of the story. The second example is what is called the optogenetic manipulation. Now, as you may have heard, there's been a revolution in, in, in neuroscience about a decade ago um, that involves the following thing. You can inject viruses into an area of interest, such as the amygdala, and make these viruses go and affect only specific types of neurons of your choice, excitatory or inhibitory. And then these viruses hijack the intracellular machinery of those specific neurons and start artificially expressing certain protein molecules in those cells. And the protein molecules they express are light sensitive. So you can now have a channel expressed in these neurons only that if you shine blue light, those cells will fire. Only those cells will fire. And if you shine yellow light, those cells will stop firing. Right? So essentially, you can turn on or off specific sub-elements of a circuit and then manipulate that circuit in a certain way and see what it does to behavior. It's a very, very powerful breakthrough because it gives you, for the first time, a causal tool of doing causal manipulations. Okay? So that's what we used. And we... We focused on, yeah. Uh, this is about a decade ago. Carl Dyseroth and Ed Boyden were the sort of the co-conspirators. Uh, I mean, this, this, this molecule was known for a long time, but they really adapted it to neuroscience. So Carl, Carl's in Stanford, and he's, I think he's done more than anybody else. Ed Boyden is now in MIT, and they're both pushing this technology. Um, so what we took note of the fact is that if you think about generalization for a minute, you're being afraid of something that is safe, right? So there's some sort of a hypervigilance that you just, there's nothing happening, but you think you better be ready for something. So there's a state of hypervigilance that's really at the core of it. And so one of the 
neuromodulatory systems that does that in terms of arousal and attention is the cholinergic system, acetylcholine. And a big hub of gener generating acetylcholine is the nucleus basalis, the basal forebrain in the forebrain area, okay? And that sprinkles acetylcholine into multiple brain areas, including the amygdala. So that was one of our re regions of interest. These projections also actually specifically innervate the amygdala. That was important. And it's been shown to play a role in aversive fear memories. So we thought that let's look at a different area of the brain, the nucleus basalis, and then target only the cholinergic neurons in the nucleus basalis and activate those and see if that can cause generalization in the amygdala without changing anything else. So that's the, so, so, so the network approach. So what we did is that there are these mice available in Andreas Luthi's lab in, in Basel where Shuprio went. These are called the chat Cree mice. So these are mice where if you now inject these channel rhodopsin viruses, they will express channel rhodopsin only in the cholinergic neurons, that too only in the basal forebrain, okay? So now we switch from rats to mice, and we inject these viruses into the basal forebrain, and we now surgically implant an optic fiber that only targets the basal forebrain, so that when you shine blue light, those cholinergic neurons will only fire. They will, of course, then release acetylcholine wherever they target, including the amygdala. And the rest of the experiment is still the amygdala experiment. We're still recording from the amygdala and doing the same exact experiment. Okay? So that's what it looks like here. Now you have two sets of implants, one a fiber optic, one an electrode in multi-electrode array in the amygdala while the animal is behaving. It's pretty crazy. So this is what it actually the schematic looks like. Optical fiber targeting the basal forebrain, extracellular single unit recordings in the amygdala, and then you repeat the exact same experiment while you're doing these simultaneous manipulations, okay? So first thing you do, fire virus-injected animals, they're not getting messed up. You can do your differential fear conditioning. The animal still freezes more to the CS plus over the CS minus, nothing is messed up there. If you just do surgery alone, nothing happens either. All of that's fine. So now you do the weak shock conditioning experiment again, right? So you're recording here, you're doing the weak shock conditioning, but you now have the added armor of the shining the blue light, okay? So what happens? You do your habituation, freeze is equal to CS plus and CS minus, safe and dangerous is not being discriminated. Then you do the weak shock conditioning. This animal freezes more to the dangerous versus the safe, that's also the same as before. And now you do the weak shock conditioning but you shine blue light on the basal forebrain at the same time. So you're now essentially doing weak shock conditioning while acetylcholine is being secreted into the amygdala and being released only by cholinergic neurons in the basal forebrain, okay? And you repeat the weak shock. Lo and behold, the freezing to the safe tone, the CS minus, the white bar, is much higher. So the animal generalizes. Although it received only weak shock, but it generalizes, okay? What happens? So you can see, yeah? Huh. No, eventually they'll lose their potency at some point, but for the next couple of weeks, two or three weeks, it takes three weeks to express the virus, okay? And then it will, it will stay there for a while. That's the way we like it, because we can do more and more experiments then, yeah. It eventually, the machinery will, you know, take it out, of course. And the light sensitivity also, you cannot shine light forever. It causes toxicity. So there are limitations to the technology. But you cannot, you can, you can silence the cells by using halo rhodopsin, which is the yellow light sensitive thing, and you can now silence the cells from firing. That's the converse experiment you can do with the same technology, but a different protein. But you can't take the viruses out of those cells. Right? It, the natural machinery will have to, take, have to take care of it. So this is actually low shock. The weak shock is the lowest shock we can do. Half a milliampere is below that the animal doesn't learn. Yeah, yeah. But it, it's a shock that is chosen for its intensity so that it discriminates well, right? If I double the shock as you saw, it will start generalizing. It will start becoming afraid of the safe as well. Right? So now you can see that the index of behavioral generalization is doubled, just like we saw in rats, 
with the strong shock, but it's all happening with the weak shock plus acetylcholine. Now the fun begins. So we know behaviorally this is the equation. This is possible. Acetylcholine coming from basal forebrain plus weak shock in the amygdala will give you strong shock-like effects. But what happens to the neurons? So here now recordings in the amygdala again, the Z scores to CS minus and CS plus, both are normal before conditioning. You condition the animals, it fires more selectively to the CS plus. This is a Q-specific neuron, well-behaved Q-specific neuron, does not increase firing to CS minus. So these are the cells, the green cells here. And now you do the same thing with acetylcholine and boom, it's now firing more to the CS minus as well. So it's generalizing. The same neuron that was Q-specific switches color and becomes generalized just because acetylcholine came in during the condition, weak shock conditioning. And you can see this shift from 4% minority generalizing cells to 29%, right? So essentially then, we're getting the same transitions. Q-specific to generalized, non-conditioned to generalized, non-conditioned to Q-specific. That's how the population shift from here to here happens. Cell by cell, we can track it, right? And so this is in mice, with acetylcholine, you're showing the same transitions as rats with strong shock. So there, there's the universal quality of this finding, is that this is the, these are the transitions that are really mediating this switch from Q-specific to generalized. Yeah? In the previous plot, you were showing the group This is the... This is the individual neurons. Individual neurons. So, but this yeah. is uh, combining from the population? No. So this is the... the one exemplar. The one exemplar, yeah. And this also you will see here now that in this case, these cells are actually also picking up, you know, the clicks. They have a little bit of response to the click buried in there. Not very crisp, but they're, they're there in the mice. So same transitions. Final question then. Remember, this is all about tones. So it's not just a lot of people are asking, is it just the amygdala? Of course, the auditory cortex has to be involved in this as well. This is basic sensory processing. The sound is coming to the auditory cortex as well. So we wanted to know what goes on in the auditory cortex in a separate set of recordings, Shupri then recorded units from the auditory cortex. Also because of the, that grand old idea that I started with, Joe Ledoux's idea that the cortex is there to decipher th these things better, higher processing, and the amygdala is the quick and dirty solution. So we were very curious to see are the same computations being performed in the auditory cortex. So he repeated these experiments, and here's now auditory cortical re responses from individual neurons to the safe and dangerous tone. Before conditioning, nothing. After conditioning, the neuron is firing more to the CS plus, so it's Q specific and not to the CS minus, just like the amygdala cell. And then you do the shining of the light and the weak shock conditioning does not increase its firing. So this cell remains Q-specific under the same conditions when neurons in the amygdala lost it because they had acetylcholine coming in. So a Q-specific neuron cannot be moved to becoming a generalized neuron even with the acetylcholine coming in in the cortex, but in the amygdala that happens, right? So this then means that that's the difference between amygdala and the auditory cortex, that you, you have a switch to generalization here, but not here. So then the rules are as follows. In the lateral amygdala, Q-specific plus acetylcholine from basal forebrain gives the generalization transition, but not so in the auditory cortex. That means that the cortex is not prone to generalization under the same conditions when the amygdala is. And that's essentially capturing Jolidu's idea that the low road to fear is biased towards becoming afraid of things quickly, and the high road to fear, the cortex, is much more sophisticated and can resist that temptation, right? So this is back to then that idea that the less refined, quick, quick and less refined, quick and dirty one, you can push it very quickly to generalization with strong shock, with adding acetylcholine, activating you know, cyclic A and PPKA, but not to the auditory cortex. A final test of this is to now say, okay, if that's the case, that even with all of this, it remains Q-specific, then the prediction is that if you inactivate the auditory cortex, it should not have any effect on generalization. 
because they make, it is not undergoing generalization. But if you inactivate the amygdala, you should block generalization. So that's another experiment that Shapiro did by now implanting cannula in both amygdala, and then infusing mucimol to inactivate all the neurons in the amygdala. So weak shock conditioning on its own and then testing, you get an increased fear to the CS plus. Then in the same animal, you give strong shock where you should get generalization, but you now have mucimol infused in the amygdala, so it's inactivating the amygdala, even though it's getting strong shock. And you test the next day, there's no generalization, there's no switch. It stays where it was. So there's no shift towards more freezing to the safe tone. So now you do the same thing just to make sure that because you have implanted a cannula, you haven't damaged the amygdala or anything due to the surgery, you repeat the same experiment in the same animal by doing the strong shock again without mucimol, but just saline in which you dissolve the mucimol and you can recapitulate the generalization. It shifts back towards the diagonal again. So you need the amygdala for generalization. Next, so these are the firing to show that the mucimol suppresses firing. You can see that in the presence of mucimol, the neurons are not firing. Now he repeated the same experiment in the auditory cortex. Same experiment, weak shock conditioning. You get Q-specific fear by itself, saline and weak shock. Now you do mucimol infusion in the auditory cortex and do the weak shock conditioning. And then text the next day. So here's the mucimol in the auditory cortex. You can see where it has spread and it suppressed the firing. Now you can see that there's no effect of generalization. They're switching to the diagonal. The animal is freezing to the safe tone. So you've inactivated the auditory cortex with no implications for generalization whatsoever. So then in summary, the lateral amygdala has a tendency to shift from Q-specific to non-specific cells, and inactivation of this process prevents generalization, not so in the auditory cortex. That's essentially what Joe had said, that the high road and the row load are, are distinct, okay? So finally then, it looks like the amygdala is, for evolutionary reasons, has neurons that are erring on the side of caution, okay? Because that's, from an evolutionary point of view, that's valuable. So it's safer to respond quickly to a benign stimulus than to respond slowly to a true threat. threat. So it means that it's better for you to respond as if this is a stick, and this is a snake and not a stick, and not the other way around, okay? Because you have a high, higher chance of survival. So in terms of survival, it is better to mistake a stick for a snake rather than a snake for a stick. And that's what the amygdala is designed to do. And these neurons are doing exactly that in the amygdala and not in the cortex. And it looks like people who have pathological fears may be treating the sticks as snakes much more of the time. So they must have something going wrong in these cells in the amygdala. So there's essentially a very, very fine line running through individual neurons in the amygdala that divides between healthy fear and pathological anxiety, okay? With that, I'll thank Shupriyo, who's absolutely heroic in his work. This is only really about one-third of his thesis work that I've presented to you, and it's very, very difficult work. It's been spectacular. He's moved on to a postdoc in Harvard now. Collaborators for the mouse work and funding. Thank you. It does, yeah. It does in mice and rats, both. Uh, I don't know if people have compared the maps for a, you know, beyond the primary origin cortex between mice and rats, and there's old literature saying that there's a good, pretty good tonotopic map for both. Uh, the auditory cortex of mice are pretty good in the sense of, you know, if you, I mean, Andreas in the same mice has shown that you can give them, you know, ramping tones with different sweeps of frequencies and the auditory cortex can track that. It's pretty sophisticated. Yeah, so there are frequency based tonotopic maps. Yeah, yeah. Or the same tones that they Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah? I'm not sure how relevant this is, but the psychology is clearly that animals, animals, and others work on one system. Mm. Right. Yeah, yeah. 
So uh, the amygdala uh, you know, is obviously designed for innate fears primarily. We are then hijacking that system to do learned fear, right? To make the blue dangerous. Or we can make it unlearn as well, actually. So there's a hardware for learn, you know, innate fear, on top of which we are using it for learned fear. And there are two paradigms. Somebody else had asked this. You can do this sort of fear memory formation where you annually becomes afraid of it. But then you can keep playing that tone over and over again without shock. And after a while, it realizes that it used to be dangerous, but it's not. And then the freezing comes down. So part of that is actually neurons within the amygdala that do the unlearning of that fear. It's not really unlearning. It's fire, you know, it's bringing it down. But this prefrontal cortex that's actually learning that extinction of the fear. So there are two circuits now involved. So there's obviously a malleable part to these hardwired responses in the amygdala that can be changed. And in that same connection, there are neurons that will respond to positive affect as well. So I think the better way to think about amygdala is not necessarily to think about it as a fear center, the way I presented, but as something that assigns emotional valence to a sensory stimulus, positive or negative. And if you do that, you have to have malleability, plasticity to be able to change that. Um, yeah. This is, um, sorry. Yeah. Is, is this also the, the technique that is recommended for psychotherapy in the case of... of uh... Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's now been actually the literature from extinction of fear, this repeated presentation of something, is being reused from the animal models, being used in humans to a remarkable degree uh, in PTSD patients, especially Afghan and Iraq war veterans. They're now actually doing, uh, essentially making them, you know, with uh, virtual reality, replaying scenes of IEDs, unexploded IEDs and things like that on the road, and making them go there in virtual reality in small doses to show that, yes, you see that, what used to be your CS, but nothing happens. And you slowly make them down. Uh, so it's extinction learning in action in, in these patients, actually. It's quite remarkable. The other thing that happens is that every time you're recalling this memory, so you, you play the tone later on, and you're recalling memory, there's no shock, right? When you recall the memory, it, apparently it becomes labile again. It's vulnerable to uh, removal. So if you now give a protein synthesis blocker into the amygdala during recall, that memory is gone, right? So that's quite amazing. So there are ways of giving drugs during recall of fear memory in these patients. So they're asked to re recall their flashback of that horrible experience, right? And as they recall it, you start giving these drugs, right? And you try to make, abolish that memory. So some of this rat literature is actually now going back into humans and giving fantastic results, yeah. Uh, yeah. How developed is this uh, technology of uh, viruses activating uh, selectively some genes? Uh, how? How developed is this? Oh, it's, it's very sophisticated. So uh, the reason I'm asking this yeah. is because, so when uh, uh, any particular animal is developing, then the cells are, uh, then uh, uh, certain organs, if they are damaged, they can... Yeah, so this is all in adult animals. Okay, we are doing targeted micro-injections into only those sub-cell types, not all cells in that area. It could be cholinergic, dopaminergic, one subtype, to your choice, you can titrate the numbers of cells you affect, right? And you express them in those cells, yeah. in an so, adult animal. So you're not really, you have to do a lot of controls to make sure that you're not affecting anything else. And now there are second, third generation viruses uh, that are far more well-tuned, they're more sensitive to light. The physics of this is actually what makes it tick, right? There are many ways of doing this now. Uh, and to couple that with in, in vivo recordings in large scale, um, is, is, is fantastic. That's what makes it. Because they actually do circuit analysis with the behavior in the intact animal. That, that's the power of it. So basically the reason why I asked this is because, so when an organism is developing, the certain organs, they have this property that they can heal. But later right. this is lost. Right. So if we can selectively uh, manipulate these genes, we can activate it, then these organs can st uh, again get this ability to heal itself. Yeah, so that's not the point of these experiments. So I have no answer to that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a different ballgame. You're talking about gene therapy or something like that. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. 
not really connected to your talk, but uh, for the anxiety therapy, uh, the medications are given. What what the target? Anxiety, the anxiolytic drugs are, you know, a lar large number of the traditional ones are uh, 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 benzodiazepines, so they actually increase inhibition, right, GABA inhibition. They're targeting the GABA system, GABA receptors. So they have a generic increase in, in inhibitory tone in the amygdala, for example. So if you have increased inhibition, synaptic inhibition through GABA receptors, the excitatory cells are not allowed to fire enough. Right, and that's that's less less firing is less anxiety. Put it very simply, yeah. So is it also a part of amygdala? It affects the amygdala for sure. Yes, yeah. So the amygdala is a structure. If you think about it, I don't know whether you notice, the basal firing rate of amygdala neurons is half a hertz. Okay, it's very 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 low. If you think about it, you don't want your amygdala cells to keep firing away, right? Because then you're going to be afraid all the time, right? So it's a very low firing, very sparse encoding network. Right? But even then, when you now have high firing and you have generalized anxiety, you want to suppress that firing, and that's why benzos are given. But they're very generic. Right? Benzos are, you know, what you buy in the, in the, in the pharmaceutical, you know, pharmacy is, uh, you know, Valium and, you know, what, whatever, Alzolam and all that stuff. Um, yeah, exactly. But that's, that's hitting all, 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 all GABA receptors everywhere. Right? So that's why people say that if you keep taking it chronically, it has its side effects. You become desensitized. You have to take higher doses and all that. So it's a very blunt tool. It's a very blunt tool. Yeah. No, no, not yet, not yet. In between benzos and single malt, I'll take single malt any day. Yeah. Right. I had a question. <laughs> right? He agrees. Yeah. So, so, yeah. These rats or mice. Yeah. Um, is, how how certain are you that what? The response of an individual rat is yeah. quote unquote typical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Very are good they question. Trained or Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic question. This is becoming a big issue now. So in the old days, or not so old days, our tendency was to take a large number of animals, take the average the way I've shown it. Mm. Right. And these animals are bred under identical conditions, you know, they we weed out everything else, variability, trying very hard to make them the same. What is remarkable is that it, despite these animal lab conditions and breeding tightly controlled breeding, there are some animals that are fundamentally different. Right? Even in my experiments, this paper where we published, we have a whole section on animals that even with the weak shock conditioning, we're showing high freezing. Mm -hmm. So they were inherently high freezers for some reason, individual variability. Animal They're there. Animal yeah, animal absolutely. So they were there. So we actually used those animals to prove something. We said, well, these are inherently high freezing animals. We did nothing that we know. But now if you try to do the strong shock on them, will they show any transition? Or are they already, already sitting at the top mm -hmm. ceiling? And they're already sitting at the top. So we actually use that as an occlusion experiment. To behaviorally you can't switch, neuronally you can't switch. Right? But there are individual differences. Now the field is beginning to recognize that, that even if in lab rats, if there are individual differences, we should go after that rather than trying to bury them in the error bar. <laughs> right, exactly. So I now actually make a separation, and all those Inherently high freezers or low freezers, low freezers could be resilient animals, who knows, right? We try to go on to, uh, after them and try to see what's different about them. And people are doing, people breed those more mm -hmm. and then generate a whole new line of animals that are hi highly anxious inherently by birth. So there's this whole, whole new field now on that, yeah, yeah. I have one question. Yeah. So, uh, so have you actually seen this, like in the data, the, the correlation between the auditory product and we haven't. We have the data, but we haven't looked at the analysis. It's and there. Question yeah. Was, uh, is, uh, what is your comment on the sort of the attention and network? How does it affect? The I think it does play a role here because you're suddenly now paying a lot more attention to the CS minus probably right. in anticipation. We have done another experiment that I didn't show in the interest of time. In other words, are they matched for the CS minus? In, under these conditions, we haven't me measured attention in any other way. But what we have done is you remember this protocol is such that although the CS minus is not being paired with the shock, they're intermingled. So what we have done is we have done training with one tone, and then the next day when we're testing recall, we have given them five different frequencies that Daniel will never saw, right, the probe tones. And, and even then the, the curve is broadened, they generalize. So there's something about being afraid of these other tones although they never saw them. So the generalization is inherent 
to these animals in some fundamental way when you record in the amygdala. Yeah. Question. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to introduce some daily regimes in the body. Yeah. Uh, so I reduce them. Yeah, they've been done. So uh, very simple things like exercise. You can put these animals in tre treadwheels and they, they show you know, remarkable benefits. Yeah, if they have more social interaction there with 12 different animals, you know, burrows and toys and all that helps a lot, brings anxiety down. Yeah, we have recorded from the amygdala and shown that these cells are less excitable and all that. So that, that's all true. Happens in rats too. Yeah, somebody needs to tell Donald Trump that. Yeah, that is true. <laughs> I think Donald Trump does not have a prefrontal cortex. Right? Yeah. I actually said that on national TV a couple of weeks ago. I was on, a, I was on NDTV for some live interview about aggression and violence. You know this guy called Ravish Kumar, he's a big shot in the India, NDTV India. I didn't know how big a shot he was, but apparently he's a big shot. And he, he at some point mentioned fake news. And before I knew it, some part of my brain just triggered a response. And I said, Donald Trump does not have a prefrontal cortex, he only has an amygdala. It fires and he sends a Twitter message. Fires, he sends a Twitter message. So I'm going to, I'm supposed to go to the US next week. We'll see if they let me in or not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you can breed a new kind of mouse, the Trump mouse. The Trump mouse, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, on that note, okay. thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, yeah.